<laughs> and it's firing on all cylinders today. That's okay. Please remember to take this out. <laughs> or don't. I guess this could be a good uh, <laughs> prologue to us talking about memory later. Throw back. <laughs> <laughs> We're back to 10 minutes ago when Kelly forgot every damn thing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia. And I'm Rachel. And I'm Kelly. And this is What You Should Read. The podcast where we should all over our books. And today we are talking to author Eric Nunnally, who is the author of the Alexander Smith series. And we have a great conversation with him coming up in just a little bit. But first, Kelly, what are you reading? I just started Across That Bridge by John Lewis. Um, I bought it several years ago and had not started it. And with everything going on now, I thought that it would be really good. And it's with his recent death, it's good to be spending some time with him. And I just started it, but I know it's going to be like a new favorite. Oh, I want to read that. Um, Rachel, what are you reading? So I have a few things going right now. Um, I'm listening to Kindred by Octavia Butler on audiobook, and I'm loving it. Uh, I'm reading the new Sue Monk Kid that I got from my book of the month box. Um, the title is The Book of Longings, and it is a retelling of the life of uh, Jesus Ben Joseph of Nazareth through the eyes of, um, in this book, his wife, Anna. So it's from her perspective, and I really like biblical retellings from the perspective of the women, like The Red Tent is one of my favorite books of all time. So yes. I, I was... Yeah, I knew I was going to love this, and so far I really, really do. And then I just started this graphic novel I got at the library. Yes, I went back to my library. <laughs> it's called Queen of the Sea by Dylan McConus. And it's uh, loosely, very loosely based on um, Elizabeth I being sort of exiled by her sister Mary during Mary's reign. And then, but it totally takes it in a whole different direction. They change everybody's names and it's its own story, but it's sort of inspired by that um, kind of rivalry. And I think it has some magic in it, but I'm not sure. But the illustrations are very cute. It's sort of medieval looking illustrations and I'm enjoying it very much. So that's oh. I have the Sue Monk kid as well. I got it in my book of the month box, but I haven't started it yet. So that makes me really excited to read it. Like it. Well, I am reading a couple of books right now as well. On my Kindle, I have You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnston going. Uh, uh, yes, Kelly, I know that makes you very happy. I don't know if I've said this before, but I absolutely love that book. It's one of the best books I've read this year. You should absolutely read it. You all should. No, you haven't mentioned it. <laughs> but yes, it is. It's adorable. It really is. I'm about a third of the way through that. And also the uh, second book in the N.K. Jemisin series, uh, Broken Earth series. Uh, I've just started that as well. I'm about a third of the way through that. And it's The Obelisk Gate. And so far, it's really great, even better than the first one, if that's possible. But a lot of things are getting explained. And the one of the characters is her daughter. So it's just like, oh. Uh, so it's really, really good. So, uh, so now, I guess, uh, fun book happenings that we found out about. So did you guys hear about this? Uh, HBO Max and the uh, sleep app Calm are teaming up and they're going to do this new series that is called A World of Calm and it is celebrities reading you bedtime stories. Oh. Each, <laughs> each episode is going to be about half an hour and I don't know the stories yet but they've announced some of the celebrities and it's Idris Elba and Mahershala Ali who I love and Keanu Reeves who is everybody's favorite at this point I think and I just think it's the cutest sweetest idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited for it. Oh, that sounds great. I want to sign up for that. <laughs> yeah, same. Okay, did you guys hear about this? 
Susan Orlean, uh, who is an author, she wrote the library book, she's a travel writer, she was drunk tweeting on, I think, Saturday night, right, of this week? And Friday night. It was Friday night. Friday night. It was <laughs> glorious. She <laughs> is an absolute legend. And if I may, I would like to just read uh, back to you what the, the, the drunk thread. I'm sure my neighbors did not notice at all that I was stumbling drunk leaving F the casual neighborhood get together. Fuck yeah. Seriously, we went to my neighbors to see their newborn colt, who was born like five minutes ago, and we had some wine. Okay, a newborn colt rocks it totally, and he thought my hand was his mom. It was not. He tasted life's infinite tragedy. As I mentioned earlier, I am inebriated. You guys, do you know, th do you thought my neighbors think? I'm a, never mind, going F to bed. <laughs> you know, I am currently trying to write a memoir and feel like a clown because who cares about my stupid life? But maybe. I care you very <laughs> Oh, and then it goes on and on. And, and she says, I am falling down drunk. First time in ages. Where is my kitty? He is my drunk comfort animal. <laughs> Where is my fucking cat when I need him? <laughs> it just goes on and on. It's so delightful. You have to look it up so that Susan Orlean's drunk tweets from a few days ago. <laughs> I, I would just like to say that I find it one of life's most unfair things that she is still so smart and so funny while drunk. Uh, the last time I got drunk, it was when I got my, my job several years ago. Julia, you know, you were there. Yep. And I was not charming or funny or smart. I was knocking things over and trying to get our friend Philip to take me to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not great. It was not great. Yeah, I remember that. It, yeah. was, it was kind of great. Uh. <laughs> okay, so now it's time for our segment, You Know What You Should Read. So, Julia, do you want to start us off? Yes. So I was going through my books the other day and I realized I haven't talked about this author yet on this podcast and she is one of my favorite writers of all time. And that's Jhumpa Lahiri who wrote The Namesake. But what you, know, what you should read is her collection of short stories, Interpreter of Maladies. I don't know if you've read this yet, but this was, is one of my favorite short story collections and one of my favorite books of all time. She's just, she's the kind of writer that just like, oh, I just, I think about her work for days after I'm done reading it and I just want everyone I know to have read it. And I, I have read this several times. I read it when I lived in Boston actually and she lives in Cambridge and I've, I read it twice, I think. And I definitely am due for a reread soon, but that's, Jhumpa Lahiri, Interpreter of Maladies. And her stories deal a lot with um, Indian culture and um, immigration. And it's just, uh, she's such a beautiful writer. So, yeah. Kelly, what about you? Okay. Um, I generally am not huge into graphic novels, but continuing my theme, um, I absolutely loved March, which is John Lewis's graphic novel series um, about his march on the Pettus Bridge and his work in civil rights in general and it is just beautiful and so inspiring and he won the national book award for it and on twitter jason reynolds said that you know we he was joking with nicola yoon that they couldn't even be mad for losing the award because how could you be mad that freaking john lewis won yeah. for this this amazing series so I would, I would recommend it to everybody, even if you think you don't like graphic novels, because it's, it's an amazing, amazing work. Cool. Great. Okay, so my recommendation is, you know what you should read, is The Deep by Rivers Solomon. So this book is um, a, it's a fantasy based on when 
when this country was um, shipping people over from Africa as slaves um, on the ships, oftentimes there would be uh, pregnant women and they were, spoiler alert, thrown overboard and mostly because they were seen as a drain on resources. So it was this very tragic, horrific thing that happened. And the book sort of delves into what happened if these women gave birth underwater to mermaids, essentially. Um, so they're these creatures um, that they call themselves the Wajinru. And they uh, basically have these collective memories from back when, you know, from before they existed, from when they're humans. And they're considered so traumatic that they have to be kept in just one Wajinru during like a generation. And then every year or so they get together for the rememberings and the memory keeper, and I forget what they call the memory keeper. Apologize, I forget what they call it, but the memory keeper will share the memories with the witch and room, kind of guide them through it so that they can experience it and remember it safely, basically. Wow. And it's it's very interesting story, and it I have to plug the audiobook, which is read by David Diggs, who is also one of the members of the musical group that wrote the song that the book is based off. Also, the song's also called The Deep, and I definitely re uh, recommend listening to that song because it's very, very good, and it makes the book make a lot of sense as well. And it's just all around a beautiful, beautiful piece of work. So that's The Deep by River Solomon. I have a copy of it and the cover is gorgeous as well. So I, but the audiobook sounds great. I love to be dig. So now I can't decide how I want to read it. So I definitely, I, I listened to it on audiobook, but I also want to read it. Yeah. Um, so I'll probably buy the book anyway. So I say do both. It's pretty short. Okay. So yeah um definitely like listening to it it's like spoken word poetry mm. because it's so lyrical and um the way david diggs reads it is so very like just it has a musical kind of a sound to it yeah um but saying that i definitely feel like sometimes in audiobooks you can miss details so i want to reread it and make sure i get all the details that sounds great Okay, so now we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to speak with Eric Nunnally, who is the author of the Alexander Smith novel series, and this is a really unique and cool detective urban fantasy series, and the main character is a shapeshifter who works with uh, detectives to solve these mysterious murders, and they kind of bring him in whenever something weird's going on, because he's... <laughs> part of the supernatural beings that in this world live in Boston. I just thought it was so interesting and such a fun read. So um, we have a great conversation with him coming up. So stick around. And we are back with Eric Nunnally. Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes. Eric is the author of the Alexander Smith novels, the first one being Blood for the Sun, and the second one, which just came out recently, All the Dead Men. Uh, so congrats on the second novel just being published. Thank you. It's been a long time coming, so very excited. Yeah. Exciting. Um, so Kelly, do you want to start us off? Yes. Uh, first, and this is probably the most important question, when we were discussing when we should uh, film or tape this, you mentioned Sunday is Epic Food Day. What is that and how can we get invited? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's only gotten worse since we've all sort of self-quarantined with the pandemics, but um, I do most of the cooking. Um, and I also, uh, and just anything that's uh, sort of an elevated, more interesting meal or drink is what I end up handling. Um, so since we've been home, um, the one good thing about this is that without the commute and without spending time at the office, <clears throat> I 
get a little more time to do prep and do cooking stuff like to cook and things like that. So this weekend, I'm going to make a chicken, a whole chicken on the grill. Uh, it's a, it'll be a beer can style chicken. Um, and uh, there'll be grilled corn, two types, one steamed, one sort of Mexican style that'll be uh, grilled directly on the corn, on the kernels and some other vegetables inside. And I made a big pitcher of sangria. So kind of epic meal day. <laughs> Not something you do every day, but. <laughs> Wow. I, I don't know if you noticed Rachel and Maya's faces just lit up when you said beer can <laughs> chicken because Rachel and I are sisters and our parents, that's one of their like go-to. They, we, oh, they do so that good. a lot. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a joke when uh, Rachel and her husband, when they were first dating, every time he would come over for dinner, they would end up making beer can chicken. So it got to the <laughs> point where he was like, not again. <laughs> it, like it's good, but that's <laughs> too much. <laughs> but I love it. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want with it. We've got an Indian spice one. I, I've got my own barbecue spice rub. Um, Oh, kind of with ginger, so kind of with garlic, just so many different ways to do it. I think it's great. What's yeah. it, now, did you all, would you do it on a gas grill or with the charcoal or? Gas, usually, yeah. Yeah, so much easier with gas, right? Because yeah. you can kind of spontaneously do it. That's how I started out doing it, but I only have a charcoal grill now. So, you know, I got to mm -hmm. light a fire, you know, wait like 20, 15, 20 minutes for the coals to burn down and set everything up properly. Blah, 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 blah. So it's just kind of, you know, a little particular, and that's why I'm the one who ends up doing it. Makes it a little more and sooty. <laughs> Yeah, it makes it a little more elevated and epic. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I can drink sangria the whole time, so it's fine. <laughs> um, so you kind of just touched on this, but um, since you have more time for this with the pandemic, uh, how has that changed uh, what you're reading and your writing process? Um, how has it changed? It hasn't changed anything that I'm reading. I think <clears throat> anybody who reads has too many books to read. Maybe there's, there's like too much to keep up with. Right. So I've got uh, recently, this is for the first time in over a decade, I have bookshelves again. And um, so I've, I've been able to pull everything out as well as pick up the piles of books and put them on the shelves. And I'm like, I just, I already have way too many books to read. So I'm not at a loss, but I have found that sort of the, um, the existential dread of what's happening between the pandemic, the country's reaction to the pandemic and the sort of, the sort of <laughs> side deal of like a kind of a little racist meltdown has been, you know, it really draws the attention. You know, I think of people call it doom scrolling. So it's a challenge to not doom scroll to like comb through all the news and try to absorb all, every detail. Um, uh, and even when I'm not looking, it's happening. So it's a little distracting. Uh, and the way I used to write uh, since I commuted to work and um, I've got a 12 year old daughter and a 15 year old daughter and my wife's an entrepreneur, so there's kind of a, um, a lot happening around the house all the time. And with all of us home, the lot happening is like happening right in my face all the time. Um, and I would sort of write in the cracks of things, either during the commute, late at night, super early in the morning. I didn't have a particular rhythm, but now the days, you know, this, the calendar doesn't even matter anymore. There's only yesterday, today, tomorrow. And it's been a challenge to try to um, figure out a regular time to write, you know, just to make progress on writing. I mean, I mean thankfully, I finished a short piece uh, just yesterday. Um, so I was like, oh, this is great. I, I haven't finished anything in a while. <laughs> Great. Yeah, without that structure that you're used to, I can imagine it's just more challenging to figure out when is the, t the writing time, whereas before it was like, like you said, I love the phrase writing in the cracks, you know, but now <laughs> it's sort of like everything's cracked wide open, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's been a, a weird challenge, but um, thankfully, none of what's happening is like 100% directly affecting us. So like nobody's sick, you know, nobody's been attacked or anything. We haven't had any incidents when we're out shopping. Um, so it's, you know, just 
uh, it's good to, to not have anything that close and, and be able to sort of apply some discipline and, and, and make it happen. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to hear everyone is safe. This yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope all the U.S. families are doing yes. okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and also, uh, what are you reading now? And I guess kind of sidebar that I'm just uh, thinking of, your daughters are older now. Um, have they read Blood for the Sun, and how much do they love it? <laughs> they haven't read it yet. Um, there's, I, every now and then I throw something at, at my 15-year-old. She's about to turn 16 in September, and it's kind of funny. She, she has such an innocent demeanor. Um, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Invisible Chains by Michelle Renee Lane. No. no. All right, so it was a real pleasure to, to meet her at uh, Nikon last year and uh, connected with her through Haverhill Press and I designed the cover for her book. Um, and in the process uh, of designing the cover, I read the book uh, before it was published and I was like, this is this is amazing. It's great. And then she got nominated for the Bram Stoker Award. Um, so uh, I had an opportunity to get a copy and I was like, sign it to my daughter. Right. So she signs it to uh, my oldest daughter and I give it to her and she reads it and she thinks it's a really good book, but she doesn't tell me this. She tells her mother that she's surprised that I, I gave it to her because there's some, there's some, um, there's some pretty harrowing the first third of the book or so takes place during the height of slavery. And the main character is enslaved and uh, female. So she is, you know, right. property. And so there, there is rape and there's a certain amount of violence associated with that. And so she was like, oh, I'm surprised you gave it to me um, because there were some, you know, some pretty intense scenes in there. And I'm like, I would rather you be experiencing these things in fiction and in a book than in movies and television and stuff like that. And I, I feel like all of us yeah. <laughs> were, were reading things like this when we were 12, you know, 11, 12, 13, everybody picked up, anybody who reads picked up something that they maybe shouldn't have been reading at around that age. And, you know, but she didn't say anything to me about it. <laughs> 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 Holy so I still hand her books, like, here, check this out. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely been there when I was younger, read books that were maybe a little bit older, but not, it's not always a bad thing. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a good, you can always put it down. Yeah. You know, it's, it's entirely up to your imagination. You can stop and ask questions mm -hmm. and look something up. Right. A learning yeah. opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So as to, let me see, uh, you asked me what I was reading now though, right? Yes. Uh, okay, so I'm reading, um, I started reading about, I'm almost a third of the way through The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead, um, which is, uh, again, <laughs> just a harrowing tale, you know, from the, the first part of the book. Um, I tend not to read these things because I do read a certain amount of um, history. Uh, nonfiction stuff that deals with these subjects. I'm kind of like, you know, I kind of had enough. I don't really need to see it fictionalized, but it's a really good book. And um, once, you know, once I've gotten far enough into it, I can really see why it's got the Pulitzer and the, the way it's structured and the way it's presenting everything. So it's a great book. Uh, the other thing I'm reading is an anthology called Black Pulp that I've wanted to read for a while and I finally got my hands on it. And it's, it's just a, a number of short, pulp style short stories. It's just the type of thing that I like to write and like to read um, that feature non-white characters. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's about it. And that's edited by Tommy Hancock, Gary Phillips, and Morgan Miner. There's two of them actually, it's the Black Pulp too as well. That sounds really good. And I love the Colson Whitehead under, the Underground Railroad's amazing yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. I got uh, I got Stone One, which I haven't read, and a friend gave me the Nickel Boys, and he gave me the Nickel Boys with, with like the, the the warning, like this, you know, considering the subject matter, this is pretty harrowing. So I don't know when I'm going to get to it. But yeah. yeah. Zone One is his. Zone One is his like kind of zombie zombie apocalypse book, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I haven't read that one yet. Yeah. 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 
I'll probably get to that before Nickel. Yeah. <laughs> it's more, it's definitely your genre, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's much more my alley. I think it's interesting <laughs> that that's where he kind of started too, in terms yeah, of. Yeah, that noticed. is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. From that to the Pulitzer, twice. Yeah. <laughs> in a row. <laughs> it's inspiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Rach. With your Alexander Smith novels, um, do you have a plan for how many are going to be in the series, or have you planned that out at all? I um, I have like a dozen plots in a file. Cool. And but there's three books in this that I'd always planned for three books in the series if I could get them published, and they are now. Um, so there'll be one more book and. That should be it. That's all I have planned for novel form. Um, this originally started as a uh, as a um, a painted. Uh, I, I went to art school, and um, there I I really love comics. Um, and there was some students who were putting together comics at the school, and people would submit stuff. And I painted five pages of this werewolf. Um, uh, saving basically Anna, his adopted daughter, sort of her little origin story uh, in five pages. And from there, it just kind of stayed in my head. Um, oh, actually, I could show them to you. You, you want yeah, to see them? That'd be yes, great. Please, please do. Grab. Awesome. <laughs> Another podcast exclusive. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Since you all also do the, do the video. I had, um, this had come up before uh, in talking with somebody. I was like, oh, let me go to the garage and dig that out. I hope I still have it. <laughs> so these were done with pen and ink and gouache. Ooh, wow. And it was sort of, you know, it's just really overwrought, terrible, terrible writing um, at the time. <laughs> and I got a little better over time, but I was thinking oh my gosh. it'd be kind of neat to try to um, get photos of these or scan them in. So yeah, you, you could do like an it. illustrated edition, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to do some comics with this stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I just thought it'd be like a nice, you know, bit of background or promotion of stuff. Like what just happened. <laughs> Did you ever think about doing them as? as a graphic novel series? I did, I did. I actually worked with someone, uh, a young woman named Erin Cole that I went to school with. She's, she's a really cool artist in New York nowadays. And we developed some of the ideas that are gonna show up in the third book. Alexander is gonna end up in New Orleans for a little adventure. Oh, and we, uh, cool. Yeah, I love that city. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. And so now you, you've written short stories as well, correct? Um, do you have a preference for um, like what you like to write, short stories versus longer novels? Or do you just kind of go by what, what you're compelled to write? Uh, mostly what I'm compelled to write. Um, I've never been one of those people that started a short story and it became a novel. Because I don't, I don't, uh, I don't wing it like that. Um, I kind of already know that it's going to be a shorter form or a longer form uh, because I have to kind of map it out. The, the nice thing about a short story is I don't have to map out as much, you know, it's like, all right, this is the premise. Here's a few scenes that I want to happen. This is how it's going to end. And then I can just, you know, crank through three, 5,000 words versus 50, 60, 70, 80, um, which requires more planning and more research and stuff. Um, who are some of the authors that inspire you? Who, who are some of your influences? Oh, man. I started out reading a lot of science fiction. Um, and uh, Ray Bradbury's The Illustrated Man sort of really showed me um, how you could you know, write a lot of different short stories. And then I read a bunch of Bradbury stuff, some of the classics. Not everything, but he's a little too prolific. Um, so Bradbury was maybe the first. And then um, Isaac Asimov.
them off because I really enjoyed uh, the robot stuff, right? I really liked all the science fiction. But I think it's the Caves of Steel when he introduces the, uh, the, the detective and the robot detective, uh, Daniel Olivas, something like that. I, I can't, I, they have unusual names. But anyway, that he wrote um, these mystery novels in this way science fiction concept and robots and stuff it was it was really inspiring um to to build something like that and it, it, so that that taught me something about um adding an element of mystery by having a structure as, and establishing some rules and letting the reader know what those rules are so if they really wanted to they could solve it um even though it was a fantastical uh, thing uh, after that david gerald um, probably inspired me the most in terms of um, uh, his imagination, his style of writing, um, and I really in actually enjoyed his, uh, um, he wrote a book about writing that I still have, of course, and it's, it's got all these stickies sticking out of it, and all the notes and stuff, um, so that, um, I really, really, I, I was so great to, to get to meet him, I met him at Bosco and we were actually on a panel and uh, got, got had a good conversation. So he's not a monster. I was glad to meet meet someone I consider something of a hero and he wasn't a monster. Um, and uh, Walter Mosley. After that, um, when I started to read more crime, um, and uh, he's you know not only does he do crime thrillers, but it, you know, he writes science fiction too and horror. And I'm like this is this is great. I, I love that people sort of, you know, not sticking to one genre um, and, and really mixing it up. Like not everything is a bestseller, but, you know, he, he, he does great work. So, yeah, Walter Mosley. And then <laughs> um, a number of women who were writing urban fantasy at the time. Um, Laurel K. Hamilton's first several books for Anita Blake and then um, the other than Mary Gentry series. Uh, I really enjoyed The Hollows, and I can, I can never remember her name. One of you is going to tell me. Kelly? <laughs> the Hollows. Yeah, um, this is one of the things I'm really bad at, like just recall, recalling names. Uh, she wrote a series of books, The Hollows. A lot of the titles are reminiscent of Clint Eastwood movies. I'm looking it up now. <laughs> <laughs> the Hollows. Kim Harrison? Kim Harrison, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and another couple of women who've, who've written urban fantasy, but again, I'm just really bad with names. Um, it just rattles people's names off. Uh, it, it's funny because the first few names I mentioned are the earliest, and then the others are the latest. And seem, I'm just terrible at remembering things nowadays. There's too I much to remember. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, speaking of memory, the main character in your book, Alexander Smith, actually suffers from memory memory loss. And yeah. it's really interesting the way that you incorporate that into the writing. And I think as a reader, and what you said about uh, as a writer putting in some rules and structure, it felt almost like that was kind of a rule or a structure to your mm -hmm. book that as a reader I found really unique and original. I had never seen that done before. So how did you come up, I mean, I guess, how did you come up with the idea for the book once it evolved beyond the short story about Anna? Um, and then how did you come up with the idea to incorporate the memory, memory loss aspect? Well, um, a couple, well, first of all, thank you. Um, a couple of things uh, had happened in my life, right? So Early on, like I said, when I when I was talking with this friend at school and sort of developing the idea, um, one of the things, one of the topics of discussion was uh, she's a huge fan of Superman, and one of the problems with Superman is that he's too powerful, and it, so it's it's very difficult to write a good Superman story. And the the trick is to write about Superman's humanity, a quest for it, right? Uh, but just to throw villains at him. You know, he's, he's just too powerful. Now, Alexander is kind of ridiculously powerful when it, when it comes to human beings. And he needed something that was going to be a problem. And I wanted that to be a problem for all monsters. And it kind of 
led into what has sort of created all the legends um, about berserker, you know, vampires and werewolves and needing to be put down by mobs and stuff like that. That they just they lose it eventually. Um, the other thing that happened is one, uh, two, three, three or four. <laughs> Uh, four of the elders in my family went through Alzheimer's or dementia and various um, those ailments, those memory ailments, um, when I was between the ages of like 12 and 17. So I kind of got to see all of that happen um, up close, and it kind of always stuck with me um, what that must be like to suddenly lose something you've had all your life. Um, so I, I got a little obsessed with memory, and I just liked the idea. And it plays into, in the books, it plays into the, the larger um, mythos. Uh, um, I don't know, has anybody gotten their hands on the second book yet? Not yet. I just read okay. the, the excerpt that's at the end, but um, okay. I haven't read the whole thing yet. Yeah. I, well, I just does. bought it, but haven't started yet, so. Okay. It's, it's part of the big big story, right? So each book is a particular story, but the big story involves exactly what they are and what's happening and why. So all that will come up um, in, in, in more direct ways in, the, in the, the third book. So anyway, I wanted to say it became something more purposeful, like there's a particular reason for it happening. He's not just losing his mind. But I also hated the idea of someone being able to live for centuries and being perfectly intact. And I'm like, I'm, I've only made it in my 50s, and I'm starting to forget things and, you know, this, this stuff that I can't particularly remember or do anymore. And I'm like, yeah, you get 100, 150. <laughs> right, right. The main character is, what, 150 years old, and there's yeah. so, much, so much in his past, and it's interesting how he'll get flashes of it, right, and maybe not the, yeah. whole, the whole thing. And you can, I can kind of tell there's going to be more that comes out in the rest of the series. There is, there is. Yeah. <laughs> there is. Um, <laughs> there's a lot in the book that deals with culture and race and, and history. And mm -hmm. um, I, that part was so interesting. And did you think a lot about that and bringing in your own history and uh, things like that when you were writing the book? Um, it did. Um, one of the things that made me write this, like I said, I was um, I was reading a lot of urban fantasy um, prior to writing it, and I, I wasn't seeing any types of characters that I could relate directly to, who right. also were not um, existing in the environments that I existed in, or uh, or had the experiences that informed their cultural perspective today. And I was like, oh, this would be interesting to have a character that's um, the two ethnicities in the country that have been stepped on the hardest um, and to have um, a long enough experience to remember the worst aspects of it. Because I, 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 I love the idea of having a character that is, um, there is no saving Alexander. Like the things that he has done cannot be, you cannot come back from. Um, I really like the idea of a of, of character that's irredeemable, um, but is still trying to overcome those poor decisions and, and do better things. Um, and it didn't, it didn't uh, come out until uh, uh, the original publication of the first book, Blood for the Sun, was 2014. And I think it was 2016 when uh, a long lost cousin in our family um, contacted someone, uh, contacted my uncle, he had a bunch of digital information, so my uncle pushed him to me. And I come to find out that, so Alexander's father is supposed to be uh, someone who escaped slavery, goes up to Mississippi and Canada, and then he marries a um, native woman in Saskatchewan, eventually. And you know, I come to find out that our great great grandfather escaped slavery, fought in the Civil War, and then married a, a, a woman of native descent in Massachusetts from the Massachusetts group that's part of the larger group of natives here. It was just 
blew me away. Yeah, wow. So things really did come together there. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. And speaking of Massachusetts, Boston is basically a character in this book, I think. I mean, you and I were talking before we started recording. I used to live there, and I just felt like there was such a sense of the place itself in the book. Um, did you think a lot about that when you were writing it? I, I, I just loved reading it, being like, oh, Storrow Drive. Oh, Fenway. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I really did. Um, my So I, I grew up in Mattapan, which is sort of the southernmost yep. part of Boston before you get to Milton. <clears throat> and um, it always, I went to, actually went to high school in Marblehead. So I would get on a bus super early in the morning, 20 miles up the coast to, to go to high school. And uh, as I got older, I was seeing everything in between where I lived in Boston and where everyone else lived in Boston. And, you know, I had family in Roxbury, which was the next, uh, neighborhood over, um, but then uh, Mattapan's a part of Dorchester, but North Dorchester is very different from South Dorchester, right. and, you know, just all different um, pieces, and I didn't own a car until my 30s, so I was always riding my bike or on the train or on the bus or on foot, and I was really seeing, you know, I, I wouldn't hesitate to, to go anywhere, um, so I was, you know, every place that's in the book, I, I had literally been there. Yeah. Um, and am intimate with to a certain extent. And I really wanted to portray some of that so that anybody who's from the area yeah. <laughs> could see these things and be like, oh, that's neat. You know, that's, this is here yeah. and that's there. And, yeah. No, I definitely yeah. felt so really like I was... a part. Yeah. Yes. In the second book, there's, there's the um, uh, Storo Drive plays in again. Uh, and there's a particular part of Storrow Drive that if, if you've been along the, uh, the water, you might remember it. Um, then it goes under a bridge, there's yep. a rattling uh, wooden bridge that you go under. I'm 100% sure it's still there. Um, but stuff like, yeah. stuff like that. So it's, it's sort of some more of that in the second book. That's great. Yeah, I definitely felt like I was there uh, when I was reading it. And not only that, but I feel like you brought in the history of different neighborhoods in a lot of ways so mm -hmm. well too, like the gentrification of the South End and mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, everything. It was very, very, yeah. very cool. That was a lot of fun. There was, uh, yeah. I had an experience with Mel King. Um, uh, oh shoot, what was it called? Was it Mandela Land? There was, mm -hmm. there was a political movement in Roxbury uh, to secede from Boston. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Of, oh yeah, because of the neglect. And Mel King was, yeah. I think he was a part of that, but then later on he ran for mayor. And there's, um, I participated in a, you can see that's a portrait of Mel King there. Yeah. And his little comic interview underneath. Um, and he, at the time, he worked in the South End at Technology Center. He's always been a very community oriented guy. Um, and we were talking about the history of the South End, which then I looked into, and then that led into, eventually led into what's in the book. The, uh, the second book actually features some aspects of the history of the Back Bay, which was also a lot of fun <laughs> to, uh, to literally dig up yeah. and, and, uh, and weave that into the book. Um, it's it's kind of weird, like, it, you know, have an idea. And I'll, I wonder if there's anything in history that will support this that I can sort of make the two meld together. Um, yep. So that happens again in the second book. Look forward okay. to <laughs> Cool. So where can, uh, where can we find your second book? Where can readers get the series? Um, it's just about anywhere books are sold. You can certainly have it ordered at your local bookshop. Um, you can find it from the publisher, Haverhill Hill, Haver Hill House Press. Haverhill, Haverhill. <laughs> I can't believe I'm blowing this. Haverhill House Press. Um, uh, Bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, Smashwords. Uh, there's a number of places. It's kind of, it's available everywhere it should be, which is great. Fantastic. And yeah, you mentioned bookshop.org and we always try to give a, an, a shout out to an indie bookstore every episode. And mm -hmm. we would love to know what are your favorite independent bookstores that people should check out? Well, 
Kelly and I went back and forth on this a little bit, and I, I, have, I have two, and it's, there's a reason I have two. <laughs> so one is Paper Nautilus, which is a used bookstore in Providence, um, and it's a lovely place. It's got two levels, um, and everything you can imagine is in there, So, but you can also order new books there. Um, the other place is Riff Rat, which is, it's small, but half the place is a bookstore. You know, it's kind of a highly curated modern bookstore. The other half is a bar. So you can buy a book, you can get a cocktail and sit down and read it, or vice versa, doesn't matter. <laughs> but I also had my, um, uh, I had a, a, a book launch there for Lightning Wears a Red Cape, and, uh, and that was a good time. So I, I think you said you wanted to hear this, this story about that? Yes. <laughs> Always, yes. So, so the, um, I had been calling around trying to set up um, like reading events and, and book launch uh, things and things like that. And I was getting like a lot of weird reactions. Bookstores were, were didn't seem to be, um, every place I was calling anyway, didn't, couldn't quite wrap their heads around the author calling them, which is, I thought was really strange. Um, I mean, I, I would love to have had, uh, you know, someone in promotions or something, a PR call and set it up, but it, it just, that wasn't going to happen. Um, so Riff Raff, we finally make an arrangement with Riff Raff to have this. Um, and we have it on a Sunday afternoon. Um, and one of the reasons we were able to do this is because it's their, their slow time. And I was like, that's fine. I am inviting a whole bunch of people who love to read and they love to drink. You'll be good. <laughs> so, um, like I said, they, they were very skeptical about this. And then we filmed the place and it was amazing. And they bought a lot of drinks and they bought a lot of books. And afterwards, they were like, oh my God, this was, this was awesome. We're so, so glad that you were able to come in and do this. But it's a lovely little place. I, I really enjoy it. Great. I love a good bookstore slash bar. I can't I You're can't so wait. Cute. Yeah, I know. And I can't wait until it's safe to crowd them again in that way. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we always ask our guests to recommend a book to us on the <laughs> What You Should Read podcast. So what is a book we should read? Okay. Um, first, I would say The Lesson by Cadwell Turnbull. Okay. Um, it, it's, a, it's a book about uh, aliens coming to Earth, but they don't land in New York or California or somewhere in the desert, they land in the Caribbean. Um, and he himself is from the area. So it's a very interesting um, story that weaves the ideas of colonialism and race and class. Um, great book. I thoroughly enjoyed this thing. So I would highly recommend this book. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. And there's a couple others too. Um, one Please. comic. <laughs> a comic book, The Immortal Hulk. So Steve Epting and Al Ewing, uh, Al Ewing and Joe Bennett have been writing and drawing this, this book, and I've been buying the graphic novels that they come out. It's like a radical new direction for the Hulk, and it's got such horrific elements to it, and it introduces a whole new aspect and personality to it, uh, to the Hulk character himself, and uh, it's just a really solid, um, really solid comic read. And the last one is Chosen Ones by Veronica Roth. Has anybody read that yet? I have it, but I, I haven't read, read it yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a really good book. Like, I, okay. I, 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 wasn't, uh, I wasn't into the series that she wrote before that, but um, this one deals with uh, the aftermath of being a hero, mm -hmm. which I, just, I think is such a fascinating subject. Um, and in fact, I, like I, I wrote a short story called Uniform that's in a FIA literary magazine, um, was in the last, the past issue of it. And it deals with a, a military cyborg who's after war. Like, so what, what do they do afterwards? Um, so, so her novel deals with, I, I think there's five of them. Um, and it's, it's just great. I really enjoy it. Uh, that's great. Okay. I'm going to put that uh, high on my <laughs> next to read list. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Great characters, great action, great yeah. idea. Yeah. That sounds great. Well, 
Thanks so much. This has been so much fun, Eric. And where can people find you? Are you on the social media feeds? Uh, uh, I am. Um, I have a website, ericmelody.us. Um, I, I had .com, and then I didn't have .com for a while, and someone bought it and tried to extort me for it. And I uh, said, you know what? Good luck. Yeah. Good luck with that name. You know, right. <laughs> there is literally no one else on the internet with my name the way it's spelled. Um, so yeah, I'm on Twitter. Um, I have a Facebook page and Instagram. Great. And we'll link and they're to all, all under of my it. name. Yeah, Great. a weird pseudonym. <laughs> <laughs> the Eric Nunnally. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, this was so much fun. Thanks again for joining us. And we'll hope you'll, you'll come back on the podcast again when the next books start to come out. I'd be more than happy to. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thanks, Eric. All right. So thanks again so much to Eric Nunnally for joining us. That was a great conversation. And if you all want to follow us on social media, we are at WYSR underscore podcast on Twitter and on Instagram. And we're at what you should read podcast on Goodreads. And you can email us at what you should read podcast at gmail.com. And yeah, give us a shout. Please rate and review us on, on iTunes or wherever you listen. And now you know what you should read. You should see me in a crown by Leah Johnson. That's and, and Blood for the Sun by Eric Nunnally. <laughs> and the second book, which is available now. Yes. You're welcome.